Hey folks, can y'all hear me and see me okay? Somebody just give me a yes or a thumbs up or anything so that I know that I'm coming through. Y'all know the drill. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Randy. Very good. Excellent. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about tonight, I can't remember if I told you all this or not before. Uh, but I do remember talking about it to uh, the magnum opus groups. S you know, someone was asking at one point, and forgive me if I'm repeating myself, if I did tell you all this, I can't remember, but I think it's, it's kind of important. So I'll say it again, even if I did say it before. Uh, somebody in one of the magnum opus groups had asked uh, a question that, and I'll mangle it, but the, the essence of it was about um, like making, having this desire to make more progress along the path of magic. You know, what, what could they do or, you know, how, what, you know, what could they engage in or, or I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was about making progress along the path of magic. And my answer to that, like the way that I explained it, was honestly, for a very long time, for many years, when I first started doing magic, I would say probably the first, I don't know, between at least five years, at least five years that I was doing magic, if not longer, I didn't know there was a path. I was kind of like most people in the world today that whenever they think of magic, they don't know that they're, that this is like a progressive thing, that it's a journey, that it's like this, you know, that it's this path with stages of development and mile markers along the way that you meet and all of that sort of stuff. I did not know that for years. So I wasn't even thinking about like making progress along the path. All I knew of magic, all I thought of magic was that it was a way of manifesting things. It was a way of um, making things happen. It was a way of creating change, either in myself, like changes in me or changes in the external world, you know, changing my situation, my circumstances, all of that kind of stuff. That's that's all I thought magic was for a long time. So for all of those years, I wasn't thinking about making progress or getting anywhere. All I was thinking about, all I was focusing on was getting better and better or more and more proficient at doing those things, at manifesting, at changing, you know, both myself and the outside world and learning all different kinds of ways that I could do it, you know, like the big ritual formats and and the, the smaller, more energy focused things, you know, like in the Michelle Belager books or the Qigong books or all of that sort of stuff. All I focus, I did when when I do something that I love, I there's very few things that I've been obsessed with my whole life. Very, very few. You know, I can I can count them on on a couple of fingers, actually. But one of those things was magic. And when when I started figuring out how to do it, I did it nonstop. You know, pretty much every moment that I was awake, I was doing magic in some way or another. Either I was doing the middle pillar and sometimes not in the, the most formal way. You know, here's the thing about all of this stuff. There are formal ways of doing this where you're standing there with your eyes closed and you're visualizing all the spheres and vibrating all the mantras and all that kind of stuff. But you also want to do things like say you're standing in line at the grocery store or when I used to do it 
like one of the things I would do is, you know, one of the very few times that I was brought out of my cell in prison when I was on death row is once a week, there was a Catholic priest that would come in and he would take me and two other guys out of our cells and into this chapel. And he would do a small mass for us. And we would be in there for about between an hour and two hours, give or take. The whole time I was in there, I would be focusing, you know, every time we're supposed to be doing a prayer, we're sitting there with our eyes closed. I'm just visualizing the the spheres of the middle pillar and I would focus on one and inhale and make it glow brighter and inhale and make it glow brighter and inhale and make it glow brighter. Even if I couldn't do the whole thing, it was like I was doing that constantly, nonstop. And that kind of reminds me also like the next step in what we're going to learn. Like last time we covered the, the uh, Quabalistic cross and the Quabalistic cross is like the, the bookends, the brackets for the LBRP or the lesser pentagram ritual. So the two things that people usually learn next, and I'm not going to do both of them at one time, just because what I'm trying to do now is give it to y'all in tiny bite-sized chunks so that you don't get overwhelmed, you don't get overloaded, and you can put it into practice and start doing it and start, you know, getting a better understanding of this stuff. But traditionally, you would get the middle pillar and the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram at the same time. And those were the two main things that you were supposed to focus on and practice over and over and over. Just drill them into the ground, drill them into your psyche, drill them into your soul over and over and over. Where was I going with this? I had a point. My brain went to sleep for a second. I am, I'm kind of exhausted. I'll, I'll tell y'all something else. And this is kind of neither here nor there about uh, what we're talking about tonight. But, um, oh, oh, also let me tell you, uh, the courts did make a ruling on the case. It doesn't mean anything at all. All they ruled is that they're giving the state yet another month to respond to our briefs. Um, and by that time, I mean, what they're trying to do is is stall for time, just as they've always done, so that by the time the state does file a brief, the court will go on break for the summer. Nothing happens in the summer. Essentially, what it comes down to is uh, we won't hear or know anything before uh, late autumn or winter at the earliest. Nothing big happened. But anyway, at any rate, um, you know, I talked about how. I'm not sure I want to go into that yet. I kind of want to save that for a little while. Um, but my point is. I wasn't thinking about making progress along any kind of path. I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh trying to, to get anywhere or accomplish anything on a, you know, spiritual path. I was just trying to get better and better and better at these rituals and at using and, and, and at using them in a practical way to create change around me. Everything else happened as a result and a consequence of doing that. You know, we we could have all kinds of philosophical conversations about stuff like, uh, let's say, for example, even attaining the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. For years, I didn't even know if that was a real thing or not. You know, everybody in magic has heard of that, but I didn't even connect it as being part of the path of magic. Essentially, what that is, that's the mile marker on the path that sort of equates almost to reaching puberty in magic. It's not this high, grand, exalted thing that's the be all and the end all of everything. It's the middle part, the middle sphere on the tree of life, Tipareth, the middle. You still got the entire top half of the tree to go. That's why I say it's sort of like reaching puberty going through what they would call crossing the abyss. That would be the equivalent of adulthood. You know, going from adept to master, that would be becoming an adult in, in magic. Uh, 
So even though it's not this grand exalted thing that that most people think it is that I myself thought it was at one point, I didn't even know if it was real or not. You know, it's like, what what does that even mean? You know, the way people talk about it, the way people write about it in books, I had no idea, no clue what it even meant. As far as I knew, it's one of those things that maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen, or maybe it can only be done one way, which was, um, you know, using the book of Abramel and the mage, you know, the sacred book of Abramel and the mage, which most people think of whenever they think of that ritual. There's a million other ways to do it, but that's sort of the one that's become synonymous with this stuff. The middle pillar, no, it's not. It's not some sort of ancient technique that's been around forever. Uh, someone asked, uh, Oyeko says, was the middle pillar ritual designed by Israel Regarde or did it exist before? Um, the middle pillar is a very, very new ritual. And, and the way it came about was members of the Golden Dawn wanted to do something that was similar to the chakra system using the chakras in the east so they came up with this uh regarde came up with this this ritual that would allow them to do some of the same sorts of experience have some of the same sorts of experiences and do some of the same sorts of practices that you could do with the chakra system but they also are not the same thing you know for example when we're talking about the elements like the difference in working with the elements and working with the planets. When you're working with elemental energies, you're working with energies, parts of your aura, parts of your soul that are the most deeply hardwired into your physical form. Well, when you're working with chakras, chakras are also sort of like that same degree of, of baked in. Like they are almost, they are very, very closely connected to your physical form uh the middle pillar spheres are not that inherently part of incarnating into the physical realm when you incarnate into the physical realm you have chakras like you there may be blockages there may be damages you know something may be wrong with some of some people's but they're still going to have all of that's not necessarily the case with the middle pillar spheres. When you work with the middle pillar, you are creating these energy spheres within your energy system. Uh, and, and you're trying to make them as real and, and dense as you possibly can, but it takes time to do that. Whereas the chakra systems are just inherently in us and functioning from birth. These systems don't do the same things from my own perspective perspective and my own experience, I would say the middle pillar is far, far more valuable to the work that we're doing. You know, whether it's manifesting things, charging things, attaining immortality, you know, spiritual immortality, you know, that was another thing too. It's like, I'd heard rumors of that stuff. I'd heard rumors that there were ways of attaining spiritual immortality, you know, that you were going to, uh, cease to exist after your physical death unless you did certain things. And I think most of that knowledge I gained from Taoism. You know, if you, there's a guy named uh, Montauk Chia, that's probably like the guy in the field of Taoist literature. You know, he's written so many books. It's, it's insane. I don't even remember how many. And they're all super technical, not very fun, dry, boring reading but very densely packed with all kinds of information. Uh, didn't mean to get off on that. But the other thing about the middle pillar, the reason I bring this up is because traditionally it wasn't something that like, say, say magicians like John D and Edward Kelly, or, you know, all of those old school guys, Cornelius Agrippa, um, Paracelsus, you know, none of, none of those old, old, school magicians were doing the middle pillar. They were doing things more in line with the pentagram and the hexagram rituals, like the lesser pentagram ritual. However, I believe that it was the doing the middle pillar that greatly sped up 
my ability to perceive the energies that I was working with when I was doing the pentagram and hexagram rituals. Like I have never come across anything anywhere in any system in any tradition that enhances your psychic intuition, your psychic vision more than the middle pillar does. And whenever I say that, once again, I've explained this before that, you know, when I'm talking about being psychic, I'm not talking about touching a knife <clears throat> and having visions of some murder that happened like they do in cheesy movies or what have you. Anytime I'm talking about psychic intuition, psychic perception, what I'm talking about is your ability to see, perceive and shape the energies of the subtle realm. It was the middle pillar, you know, above and beyond anything else that that allowed me that really, really was like throwing gasoline on the fire for me for those things. So it is important. It's incredibly important. I consider it one of the two most important things that I've ever done in magic. You with me so far? Um, but the thing that I wanted to go over tonight, and this was another uh, thing that we talked about in Magnum Opus, but I think it is a tremendously important uh, exercise, which is why I'm sharing it with y'all. It ties into doing the um, uh, Billy, Billy Vicente says, if we've been doing the middle pillar for a long time, would you suggest we do all 10 spheres instead of the five? Yeah. Yeah, actually I would. If you've been doing the middle pillar for a long time, and you're proficient at it, you know, I would say if you've been doing it for, if you've been doing it like at least almost daily for, you know, like six months, um, I would say, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, let me find something real quick. I'm going to get up. Y'all aren't going to see me for just a second because it's over here on a shelf. I want to find something that someone sent me that, that is pertinent to doing yeah, Billy says it's been about a year. Yeah, I would say if you've been doing the middle pillar for a year, yes, use all 10 spheres. G give me one second. I'm going to see if I can find something that kind of illustrates, uh, gives you an idea of how to do them. Give me one second. Okay, I can't find what I did with it, so I'm just going to have to explain it to you. I'll try to find it. I've got a bunch of stuff over here on these shelves. I'm going to have to go through and try to find it, but I'll try to just explain it to you. Um, there's, there's several different ways you can do it. Yeah, yeah, Billy says, uh, Billy says, I would love to, no, wait, that's not Billy. Uh, oh, Billy says, I think it was called the flaming sword or something like that. So there's there's two different ways you can do it. Actually, three. And one is called uh, the path of the sword. One is called the path of the serpent. And the other doesn't really have a name. But And this is what I was looking for. It's a piece of jewelry that someone sent me, actually, that has all 10 spheres on it. But it doesn't have the traditional shape of the tree, you know, with all of the paths and everything that we normally think of when we, we think of it, the, all it looks like is you've got the a, a path running down the center, which is the middle pillar, like doing the middle pillar. And then coming off of the middle pillar in your head, there's just one branch of light, one path of light coming across, and you'll have a sphere on each side of your head. So you've got Kether above you. You've got uh which come you've got on your on the right hand side you would have Bana. On the left hand side you would have um, Hakma. So on either side of your head, and whenever you visualize them, whenever you do those, try to feel them almost as if they're half in your head and half outside of your head. You know, the same way whenever you're doing the middle pillar and you're focused on the, the black sphere at your feet, it's sort of encircling your feet. 
so that the top half of the black sphere is above your feet and the bottom half of the black sphere is below your feet, almost in the ground. Same way on the sides of your head, you've got Hakma and Bana here so that they're half in and half out of your temple area. You want to try to feel your temples whenever you're vibrating the divine names like Yehoah, Elohim. You want to try to feel it in the temples of your heads as you're seeing the spheres vibrate. So you've got the middle pillar. You've got this sphere of light or this shaft of light coming this way with a sphere on each end, a sphere on each end. Focus on your uh, middle pillar and see another shaft of light come out to both of your shoulders. And on your shoulders, you have um, uh, Geborah and Hesed, uh, the blue one on your right shoulder, the I mean, I'm sorry, the red one on your right shoulder, the blue one on your left shoulder. Same thing when you get down to your pelvis, down to the middle pillar area. Another shaft of light comes over to each hip. And you've got um, Netzach and Hod on each of your hips. So all of these at your temple, at your shoulders, and at your hips, you're going to try to see them as if they're half in and half out of, of your body. And you're going to try to feel them in that part of your body when you're doing. But yes, absolutely. Oh, and here's the other thing. When you were first taught to do this. Oh, but that's the third way of doing it. Whenever you're doing the path of the, the flaming sword, all you're doing is vibrating the spheres in the order that they come down the tree. So you would go from uh, Kether to Hakma to Bana you know, all the way down. And that's why I call it. Um, it's also called uh, like the light, but that's the sword path. And it's also called sometimes the lightning, the lightning path, because that's, it looks like a lightning bolt as it's coming down the tree, coming down your body. The reason they call it that is because this is the order that divine energy goes in as it enters the physical realm to create, to create, the material universe. That's the way divine energy comes down through the levels of reality as it's manifesting in the world. The uh, wait, Angie says, is this the one that resembles the Coptic cross? Old Orthodox priests used to carry staffs with it on the end. Yes. Yep. That's that is what it looks like. Uh, no, Douglas is asking, can this replace the celestial lotus? No, these are two entirely different things, two entirely different practices. Uh, but the second way or the third way of doing it, the first is like I described where you've just got the middle pillar. You've got the two spheres here, the two spheres here and the two spheres on your hips. Second way is the path of the flaming sword. Third way is the path of the serpent. The reason they call it the serpent is because it's like the energy is winding itself back up the tree, back from Malkuth up to Kether. Whenever you do it that way, you start at the bottom, at your feet, at Malkuth, and work up in the order that the, the spheres go up the tree. So you would do Malkuth first, and then you would do Yasad, and then you would do Hod, and then you would, no, then you, you would go from Malkuth to Yasad, to Hod, to Netzach, to Tipareth, on up in reverse order. The differences in these two things, both of them have benefits. The differences is if you're going to use it to manifest something, doing the, the, the lightning path would be more beneficial. Like if you're going to put it in a talisman or you're going to put it in a visualization or whatever it is, doing the lightning path would be more beneficial because it is the path that divine energy takes as it manifests. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to manifest in the spiritual world. The other way, the opposite way, the way the path of the serpent that winds back up, that is more beneficial if your purposes are just like spiritual evolution like making progress on the path of magic, because that's what we're trying to do. We find ourselves in the realm of Malkuth in the physical world, and we are trying to slither our way back up this tree to the source from which we came from, to Kether. Makes sense? 
Let me see. Give me one second. Yep, Angelica, that is exactly right. Give me one second. Just reading all y'all's questions. We got things. One second. So I, I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to go back and get diverted. Um, give me one second. Uh, yeah, uh, Andrew. Andrew says, do the additional spheres have keywords like that of the traditional middle middle pillar? Absolutely. And then you need to memorize all of those because you're going to I mean, part of the pur purpose of memorizing the stuff is because you're going to be using the stuff in a practical way uh every day you know you're going to be you you're going to be using you need to know what each of these energies represents on these spheres on the tree so that you know whenever you're getting ready whenever you need to do something you're going to know which one to call on like if you're wanting to manifest let's say like financial abundance you would be using the sphere of hesed um which is the blue sphere about growth and expansion and all of that kind of stuff, but you can't really use it completely and effectively if you don't know like the divine name associated with it that you need to vibrate, the archangel name that you need to vibrate, or even, you know, even when we're doing like the, the magnum opus stuff, how right now, and this is another thing, guys, for those of y'all that are in the magnum opus group, um, we're working right now. Well, we're not working. We've got it finished. We've put together an entire curriculum for the earth grade. Everything, you know, that you need to do, that you need to be working on, reading material, the rituals you need to be doing, all of that kind of stuff corresponding to earth. How does this tie into his said? My brain just went blank. I can't remember. I lost it. This this tied into what we were just talking about in some way. What was it? Yeah, I mean these things you can find them anywhere. You know these names, but but all of this kind of stuff. Oh oh, part part of the Earth stuff, the Earth grade. Part of what you're supposed to be doing when you're in the Earth grade is familiarizing yourself with all of this stuff. All of these divine names, all of the color correspondences, all of the archangels for every sphere. You know what? You know how bad my mind is, how I can't remember anything, how I forget everything. The only thing, even, even in the worst parts of that, like when I'm forgetting everything but my own name, the only other thing that I never forget, and it's because it's just ground so deeply into my brain and into my psyche from doing this stuff for years and years and years, were all of these correspondences. Like what color corresponds with each sphere, what properties are associated with each sphere, what the divine names are for each sphere, what the archangels were, all of that stuff. That's the only thing that I've never forgotten. And it was because I used them. You know, I don't suggest you just sit around and try to memorize this stuff the way some people do, turn it into nothing more than an intellectual game. The way that I memorized it, the way that I remembered it was just by using it in a practical way every day over and over and over. Exactly. Billy says you won't even have to study them. Just keep practicing and you'll naturally memorize them. Exactly. Like if something's going on in your life and you're like, OK, what do I need to invoke or what energy do I need to use for this particular situation? And you look it up and you you're reading it and you're doing that ritual over and over Then for the rest of your life. You're going to know, OK, if I'm dealing with this, then I need to invoke this and the correspondences for this or that. Exactly. That is exactly how I did it. Exactly how I did it. Uh, no, Adius Angel, the curriculum won't be on here, but I'll talk about parts of it, the parts that are pertinent and that I think people on here uh, might get use out of. Um, but it's it is stuff that's only. Uh, in the magnum opus groups. Uh, okay, so let me think. What What's the next thing? Oh, okay. So 
here's the next thing to focus on before you even start doing the entire lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. This is an this is an exercise that I did for years. Well, uh, not years. I didn't do this particular one for years. I did this one for months, a few months when I was in prison. And it's one that I suggested that all of the people do uh, in magnum opus. So this won't be new to y'all. Um, but this is something that is incredibly, incredibly beneficial just because a lot of people, whenever they're doing like the, the pentagram rituals, all they're doing is like moving their arms around and saying divine names, but they're not adding tactile sensation into it. And, you know, I've talked about how tactile sensation, being able to feel things is one of the most important parts to making this stuff work. Remember in, I believe it's the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus tells the disciples whenever he's teaching them how to do something, like how to do a miracle, how to manifest something. He says, ask for it to be done and feel as if it has already come to pass. Like try to make yourself feel the way you would feel if it were already yours, if it had already manifested, like whatever it is, would you feel relief? Would you feel joy? Would you feel happiness? Whatever it is that you, would you feel contentment? Would you feel whole? Whatever it is, make yourself feel that. And I've talked about this stuff on here a million times, how whenever you're doing that, what you're doing is uh, communicating to the field this quantum field that we exist within, to the mind of God, what you want to happen. And I talked before about like Greg Braden and how he had a friend who was a, a Native American shaman on a reservation. And he calls him one day and says, you know, we, we're in the middle of a drought and I'm going to do uh, ritual work for rain. So would you want to come over and, and watch or be part of it later? And Greg Braden says, yes. He goes out with this guy in the middle of nowhere. The guy's got a stone circle on the ground. The guy takes off his shoes, gets in the middle of the circle, and stands there for a few minutes with his eyes closed. He opens his eyes, gets out of the circle, and says, okay, let's go get dinner. And Greg Braden says, well, aren't you going to do something? Aren't you, know, you going to do like a ritual? Is that it? What would you do? Did you just pray? And the guy said, what I always do is I stand in the circle and I just make myself feel the rain. I stand there and I feel what it would be like for the mud to squish up between my toes, for the rain to be soaking down over me, for me to be completely drenched. I stand there and I make myself feel that for a couple of minutes and that's all I have to do. That's the same thing Jesus said to do. Tactile sensation. Tactile sensation is a vital part of doing magic. Yes, visualization, breath work, all of that kind of stuff is important, but tactile sensation is also a huge part of this stuff. And, you know, another thing we were talking about, I can't remember if it was on here or in Magnum Opus, we were talking about like astral projection and how astral projection, one of the biggest parts of mastering that is the tactile sensation part of it. Same thing. So what you're going to do, and this also, you should get a tarot deck. Uh, you know, I've talked about over and over and over on here. I've kind of just beat y'all over the head with this book just because I've recommended getting a copy of this so, so many times. So Learning Ritual Magic by um, John Michael Greer. A few other people collaborated with him when they were writing it. Uh, but this is like this book goes into minute things that you should do even before jumping into something like the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Excellent. William says, got the book and the cards. So let me see, what are y'all talking about? Hold on. Give me one second. Yeah, Billy, Billy says these teachings make all the new age law of attraction stuff actually make sense. Exactly. All that law of attraction, the secret new age stuff, 
all that stuff is, is super watered down magic without a complete understanding of what's happening. But that's, that's exactly what that stuff is. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the thing, this exercise, a huge part of the reason, yeah, Holly says, but significantly deeper. Magic is significantly deeper than, yes, absolutely, than the law of attraction, new age sort of stuff. I mean, that stuff gets off into, you know, I don't talk shit about people's stuff, whatever. If it's your thing, it's your thing. I don't care. Um, where was I going with that? But, you know, some of that stuff can get off into like woo-woo territory. Part of what we're trying to do with magic is to ground it in the physical world, not, not get lost in cosmic woo-woo land or, you know, you will, one of the things you'll find, and this is one of the reasons it's so important to do the work of the earth grade, you know, like I was talking about the magnum opus stuff all ago, the whole curriculum of earth. One of the reasons it's so important to do the earth work is because it grounds all of the stuff into the physical world in a real way. Have you ever seen, I mean, you, you're going to come across them. If you do any kind of research in magic whatsoever, you're going to come across a lot of masters that are, and once again, I'm not just talking shit about people. I'm just saying this is what you're going to find. You're going to find people who are morbidly obese, living in their mom's basements, deeply dissatisfied with every aspect of their lives, from, from their relationships to their employment, whatever, you know, deeply, deeply dissatisfied with every part of their lives. Whole lives, whole lives look like it's going to shit basically, but they know everything about magic. That's, that's like somebody who's read a lot of books or something. If this stuff doesn't change your life in a tangible way, if it doesn't make you more balanced, more whole, more productive, more constructive, then it's not working. You're, you're missing something. Angelica says, books are windows of the truth, but they are not the door. Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so anyway, we'll get to, into more of that stuff later because that stuff is actually important. Like I said, I'm not just saying it to talk crap about people. Uh, I'm saying it because it's, it's an important part of magic. You know, you, you can't uh, escapism. That's, that's essentially the word I was looking for. What that is, it's people who are using magic as a form of escapism. And that is not what we want to do. We do not want to use magic as just another means of escapism you know, where every single aspect of our lives is a failure that we're dissatisfied with, but we escape into the realm of magic where we're this grand master. That's that's not helping any of us. I'm sorry, folks. My brain is just kind of scattered tonight and I keep losing my place. Yeah. Andrew says or cosplay. Exactly. Yeah. Angelica says, and spiritual bypassing. I've heard that word, but I'm not 100% positive what it means, to be honest, spiritual bypassing. So I can't really say. I hear it a lot, but I'm not sure what it exactly means. Yeah, Sarah says, may as well just play video games. It, it's true. Honestly, it is. Um, so here's the thing. Here's the exercise you're going to do to practice your tactile adding tactile sensation to the magic you're doing. And this is part of what you're doing when you're doing the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. You know, it's not just about the visualization. It's not just about the breath work. It's about actually toxic positivity without doing the work. 
Okay, so it's not just about the breath work. It's not just about the visualization. It's also about the tactile sensation. And this comes from uh, John Michael Greer's Ritual Magic. This is something I did in prison. What you're going to need in order to do this. Hold on, I want to read this. Angelica says, it's a way of hiding behind spiritual spirituality, almost like sweeping things under the rug and then worshiping the rug. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that does kind of make sense because that is what a lot of people in that world do. You know, like all the problems with their lives, all the problems with themselves, they just sweep it under the rug. Don't pay attention to it. Just focus on spirituality or magic or whatever instead. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the one thing you'll need to do this exercise is a tarot deck. You know, we're going to at some point, um, I've done tons of stuff on here on tarot years and years ago. Like probably when I first started doing Patreon, it was the main thing that I was focusing on because it was what so many people were interested in. To be honest, I'm not super interested in it anymore. And I think part of it is because I integrated most of the information, if not all of the information and, and growth and development that I could get from those things. See what, I'm just reading what y'all are talking about. Oh, just reading what y'all are talking about. Uh, so you will need a tarot deck. And he just, he says you can even use Crowley's uh, Thoth or Dahat deck. I honestly don't recommend that one. I mean, if you're just hell-bent and determined to use it, by all means use it. But the thing is, Crowley didn't even like the tarot. Crowley designed that just for the sake of designing that. He almost drove the woman who did the paintings insane while they were doing it. But Crowley, whenever he did divination, he uh, preferred the I Ching. If you're familiar with the I Ching, it's like, see those, those lines? The I Ching is a series of all of these lines. Like that one is the one that I have tattooed on me. Uh, the nickname of this one is the taming power of the small. And what it kind of signifies is like if you were to get this in an I Ching reading, kind of the information that it's giving you is uh, when you're facing huge obstacles, don't focus on the obstacle. Focus on taking one tiny step at a time. It's by taking one little step at a time that you're eventually going to get over the mountain. It's kind of what I'll use to keep me going in prison. That's why I have it tattooed on me. Uh, but no, you can't use the I Ching for doing this exercise. Completely different system. Uh, yeah, yeah. Joe Hawkins says, I feel like energetically that makes Crowley's deck a poor choice. If in its creation, he was driving someone mad. Yeah, I can see your, see your point there. I mean, that energy would definitely be kind of lingering around it. Anyway, what I would recommend you get is some version of the Rider Weight deck. Either the universal rider, the universal weight, the illuminated weight, the uh, Coleman Smith weight, some version of the weight tarot deck. And that's the one that most people are thinking of when they think of the tarot. You know, when you see the fool card in your head, Nine times out of ten, what you're seeing is the full card from, from the Rider Waite deck. When you get this deck, what you're going to do, and this will also, uh, doing this will also influence the way you read tarot in the future. Like these things will get all tangled up together because you're enmeshed, because you're using these cards when you're doing this exercise. What you experience with this exercise will get enmeshed with what you experience whenever you're reading these cards in the future and you lay them out and, and, you know, not just, there's two ways of reading tarot. One is by looking at the symbols on the cards themselves, the numbers, what the figures are doing, the traditional meaning, all that kind of stuff. The other way is what your intuition tells you. This is one of the ways of cultivating that intuition. 
doing this exercise plays a part in that also. So it's strengthening your ability to experience tactile sensation uh, as well as helping you develop your own um, faculties of intuition, all of that sort of stuff. When you get your tarot deck, you're going to, and we might run a little bit long tonight just because I see we're up to 45 minutes. If y'all want to, we'll go probably to an hour and a half because I have a couple of other things that I want to read to y'all. At least one other thing I wanted to read to you uh, before we get off of here after I give you this exercise. If that's cool, if y'all don't start dropping off because you're bored with my crazy stuff. Um, so to do this exercise, take you're not going to use the major arcana cards at all. You're going to take those completely out of the deck. You're only going to use the minor arcana cards, the cups, the wands, the pentacles, and the swords. Each of those suits in the tarot corresponds with one of the four directions, one of the four elements, one of the four archangels that we're working with in the lesser pentagram rituals, all of that kind of stuff. Cups correspond with water, Gabriel, the direction of the west. Swords correspond with Raphael, the east, uh, your mental faculties, your intellect. Wands correspond to the south and, and kind of where they get that from, like wands being for the south. One of the things you'll notice like in the Rider weight deck is all of the wands, um, they're not dead sticks. Like all of the wands have leaves growing on them. Like, like the ace of wands is a hand, hand of God coming out of the clouds, holding the wand. And you'll see there's leaves coming off of the wand, starting to sprout. It's not just a dead stick. Well, fire represents our life force. It's the, the leaves are growing because there's life force in the wand, in the stick. It's not a dead branch. There's still life force in it, which is causing it to bloom and grow. Uh, pentacles are, um, or some people call them coins. Pentacles or coins correspond with the north, Raphael, uh, Uriel, the color green, winter, all of that kind of stuff. So what you're going to do, you're going to take these cards and you're going to separate them into, into piles. Put all your wands in one pile, all of your cups in one pile, all of your swords in one pile, all of your pinnacles in one pile. You're going to arrange them uh, in order from starting at the number 10 and going to one. So you're, you're, you're going to stand facing east. Starting facing east, you're going to take your uh, swords cards and you're going to start at 10, the 10 of swords, uh, nine of swords, eight of swords, seven of swords, six of swords, all the way down to one. You're going to put those right in front of you it, facing the east. Then you're going to face the south and you're going to do the same thing with the wands cards. Ten of swords, not, I mean, ten of wands, nine of wands, eight of wands, seven of wands, all the way around you in the south. Then in the west, you're going to do the same thing with the cups cards, starting at ten, going down to one. In the north, you're going to do the same thing with the pinnacles cards. You're putting them in a circle on the floor with enough room in the middle of it that you can stand in the center of the cards. Make sense? When you do it, he actually does a diagram in here. If you have this book already, you'll find the diagram on page 47. If you don't have this book, I would highly, highly recommend it just so that you can read this. You know, hearing somebody describe it is one thing. Um, but being able to go back and read it over and over, that's something else entirely, especially when the person describing it is, is you know, all over the place as I am, it's probably going to do you good to go back and read this probably several times. That's another thing I want to point out. If you want to get very far along this path, you're going to have to study. You're going to have to read. I know most people don't like to read anymore. You know, we, most people that are growing, I, I was a kid of the seventies and the eighties. So I grew up on books before there was any such thing as the internet. 
most people that are around now, like people that are what, 40 and under maybe, like they've grown up on the internet. So they don't even like reading books anymore. I think I even heard, what was it? Kanye West one time was talking about how much he hated reading, how books were stupid or something like that. I understand why people feel that way now is because people's brains are not the same now. The internet changes your brain. It changed my brain after I got out of prison and I started using it. It started changing my brain. It started making reading harder for me. But if you're going to get very far along this path, you're going to have to read books. You're going to have to study books. There's no other way around it. And this was one of the ones that I studied inside out over and over, forwards and backwards. So let me read this to you. He says, set aside half an hour to 45 minutes for this exercise. Do the exercise a total of four times over the next two weeks. As long as you don't do it more than once a day, you can choose how you space these sessions. Okay, now the thing is, keep in mind, this is written for people who are doing this exercise before they ever even start doing things like the LBRP, the middle pillar, all of that kind of stuff. So he's giving them baby times. You know, if you've if you've already been doing those rituals, you want to do this more than the time that he just said. You know, he says for half an hour to 45 minutes, four times over the next two weeks. You need to do this every day. You should do this every single day for about half an hour a day. Um, you know, like I said, he's describing it for people who have never done some of the stuff that y'all are doing. Thank you, Douglas. And I'll see you soon, too. Uh, so set aside the major arcana cards you worked with in lesson two and concentrate on the rest of the deck, meaning you, you're only going to be using the minor arcana. Sort out the cards by suit so that you have all the swords in one pile, all the wands in another, and so forth. Lay out the cards as in figure eight below, leaving enough space in the center for you to stand. Make sure the cards are properly oriented to the four directions, meaning just like I just described, swords in the east, wands in the south, cups in the west, pinnacles in the north. Step into the circle and turn to face east. Perform the opening gesture, and I'll get to that in a minute because I think that's important too. When you're first beginning this work, I did the opening gesture for a long time, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Perform the opening gesture and do a minute or two of rhythmic breathing. Rhythmic breathing is the fourfold breath. Inhale to the count of four, hold to the count of four, exhale to the count of four, hold to the count of four, or some variation of that number. You know, inhale to the count of eight, hold to the count of four, exhale to the count of eight, hold to the count of four, which is what I do because I have respiratory issues that makes doing the fourfold breath a little bit difficult for me. It's an arbitrary number. Just make sure it's humanly possible to do what you're, the count that you're using. Uh, focus your attention on the suit of swords. While focusing on these 14 cards, summon up all of the feelings and thoughts associated with the east and springtime. The yellow light of sunrise, a freshening breeze, sprouting seedlings, a feeling of clarity and lightness. Let these rise up within you and around you like a sea of energies and let yourself be immersed in that sea. So what you're doing is you're facing east and your focus is on the, the swords cards. Don't stare at them. Don't, you're just like letting your gaze fall on them. You're not even trying to take in any details. Like I, I do it with my glasses off so that I honestly can't even see them. When, if they're on the floor, I can't see all the way to the floor without my glasses on. So I know it's the swords and I'm letting my gaze rest on them, but I'm not trying to take in any details of them. I'm just letting my gaze rest on these cards while I'm feeling trying to give myself the tactile sensations and the feelings that he's talking about. Like 
uh, the yellow light of sunrise. You know how it feels when you get up early in the morning, like when everybody else is still asleep and you go out to experience and you see the sun just starting to come up and you feel that chi in the air that feels like that doesn't feel like any other time of day. Like those are the things you're trying to make yourself feel as your gaze is just resting on those cards. Keep your attention on the swords and remain in the presence of these energies for several minutes. Then release the energies, close your eyes, and clear your mind. Turn to face south. Repeat the above process with the suit of wands and the energies of the south and summer. The heat of noonday, the redness of flame, plants in lush full growth, a feeling of drive and ambition. After several minutes, release the energies, close your eyes, and clear your minds. Clear your mind. So when you're facing south, try to remember what it feels like at noon on a hot summer day. Just kind of how stifling it is. How hard it can be to even breathe, like if you live somewhere like New Orleans or Florida or something like that. You know, try to make yourself feel all of that stuff once again while your eyes are resting on the wands cards, not making out any details, just resting and feeling the heat and the energy of a, a summer day. Turn to face west and repeat with the suit of cups and the energies of autumn. Dusk falling, gentle rain, leaves turning color and drifting down from the trees. Harvest, fields set to lie fallow for the coming winter. After several minutes, close your eyes, release the energies, and clear your mind. Remember, when your eyes are resting on the, on the cups cards, it's the opposite of sunrise. It's that feel, that feeling that's only in the air when the sun is going down when it's starting to set. Think of autumn. I don't know if it's the same for you as it was for me, but when I was a kid, there was like, when I equated autumn with Halloween, to me, they were like the same thing. Autumn was, the Halloween for me was not one day. It was a season. To me, the feel of autumn is the feel of Halloween. Remember what it's like when that first slight chill is starting to get in the air, whenever you're walking around and the, all those dry leaves are crunching beneath your feet. Just how amazing autumn felt. Even things like to me, one of the things I equate it with when I try to picture autumn, when I try to give myself the, the tactile sensation of autumn, you know, those cheap plastic Halloween masks that have like a little rubber band on the back that little kids wear. It just covers your face. You ever pick one of those up and smell of it? That's one of the things that I smell when I'm trying to give myself the tactile sensation of autumn. I smell those cheap plastic Halloween masks. That, that was one of the things that would save my life when I was in prison, like focusing on these things all of the associations that I had from my life before prison and making myself remember and feel and not forget or lose those things. But you're going to do that for a few minutes. And then after several minutes, close your eyes, release the energies and clear your mind. Then turn to face north and repeat with the suit of pinnacles and the energies of winter. A black midnight full of sharp glittering stars snow and bare earth, the dark shapes of tree trunks, the storing up and maintenance of what has been harvested. After several minutes, release the energies, close your eyes and clear your mind. So for me, like winter, once again, like Halloween is autumn. For me, winter is Christmas, Christmas and snow. Those cold nights when it gets dark outside at five o'clock in the afternoon, when there's snow on the ground and you hear that, that crunching sound that the snow makes under your feet, but also the way that the snow blunts all the other outside sounds. 
like it 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 muffles sound absorbs sound it's almost like you know when you go into a recording studio that has those sound absorbing pads on the walls that's kind of the same thing that snow does to the world like it blunt sound i think of all of that stuff i think of things like when i would go out on christmas eve to go to my grandmother's house where I knew the whole family is going to be there and we're going to, everybody's going to be joking and laughing and all of those things, all of those associations are what comes to me when I think of winter. Turn to face East again, release your awareness from the cards, close your eyes, clear your mind and do several minutes of regulated breathing. Perform the closing gesture, collect the cards and write up your experience in your magical journal. So when he's talking about just releasing your, your focus from the cards, you just kind of look up, shake it off a little bit. You know, you, you're mo taking your attention off of them. Um, let me see. I could see a lot of stuff going by, but I had my glasses off, so I could not see what y'all are talking about. I'm just going to scroll through real quick. Yeah, Chris says, I remember the smell of my Ninja Turtles mask. Now, here's the thing. Some people might hear that or see that and think it sounds goofy, but that's actually very important. Things like that are very important to this work and to this exercise, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. So I'll tell you, remind me in just a second in case I forget, Adias Angel says, what is the closing gesture? I'm going to tell y'all and explain to y'all. Um, yes, Sunshine says, for summer, I think of the swing set I grew up with and my favorite climbing trees. Yes, stuff like that. Those are the important things. For me, spring is always like Easter around this time of year. That's That's what I always think of. It's like you know, things are starting to get warm, but they're not roasting hot yet. And just that, you know, that feeling of life returning to the air. Yeah. Jacob Jillian, I mean, says, I think of the heat of the sun and standing in front of the spigots or in front of the seguros. Yes. I was thinking, see, I said spigots because I automatically started thinking of running through the water fountain, running through the water hose when I was a kid. Like that was the, the greatest most fun summer activity on the face of the earth was running through um, those water fountains. Yeah, yeah. Angelica says, could a practice like Lieber Resch or Kefra Nura be a condensed version of this to sync with the seasons and the sun, but quickly? That's exactly what those rituals are. That is exactly when people talk about doing resh. That is exactly the reason that they're doing this. They're because you know when you're standing and you're doing the hand gestures, all of that. I can't do it while I'm holding all these books. But you're supposed to be also not just making these hand gestures and facing these directions and reciting this mantra. You're also supposed to be you know like hail unto thee, blah blah blah. You're supposed to be feeling that energy from the east, from the west. From that's exactly. That is exactly the same thing. That is a very condensed, abbreviated version. Um, one thing about it, what this does, number one, is it's going to uh, strengthen your ability to add tactile sensation to magic. Because this is something you're going to use anytime you're doing at least elemental magic, if not other kinds, in the future. Like when you're invoking the energy of one of these elements into your circle, that's the energy you're invoking in. That's one of the ways you're making it so powerful is, is by bring, bringing all of these tactile sensations associated with each one, feeling those in your circle. That's You're going to use that every single time you invoke one of these elements. Uh, the other thing it's doing is training your ability to focus. You know, there is a lot of boring ass meditation methods out there. Anything from like the Zen meditations where you just sit and inhale in and out, in and out, trying not to 
let your mind go off on something or lighting a or, or just picturing a candle flame burning in your head. You're just seeing a candle with the flame flickering. And every time you realize your mind has went off to something else, you come back and just picture the candle flame burning again. All of those things are boring as hell to me. Those are more like what we would call static uh, forms of meditation, uh, static ways of training your ability to focus. This is a dynamic way because it changes. You're adding all these associations and stuff in. Uh, the other thing it does, and I'm going to read this to you right here because he describes it better than I can, but it ties into everything y'all were just saying, like smelling your Ninja Turtle mask, the swing set that you were on in the summer, all of those kinds of things. The reason I said that those are important is he describes it. He says, even if you have learned the traditional symbolism of these elements previously, try to focus on the actual physical experience of the elements themselves and let ideas arise from this rather than from correspondences you may have learned. In this way, you will develop your own personal grasp of the meaning of these important symbols, meaning you won't just rely on shit you read in books anymore, on stuff that you just randomly memorized and packed into your, you know, spring means that or, or swords mean this and they correspond to this and they represent that, you know, like all that intellectual crap, what y'all were just describing that's what you're trying to develop, things that are unique and personal to you. Now, one of the reasons you're using the cards and what I mean about how this stuff all gets enmeshed is in the future when you start using the cards to do tarot readings, even if you're not consciously focused on those symbols, like trying to make those symbols out, you're just letting your gaze rest on those cards while you're like cultivating and, and experiencing all of these sensations and associations and all of this. You're you're speaking to your subconscious, subconscious and your unconscious mind so that whenever you start laying these cards out and doing readings in the future, that that's going to start coming up. That's going to start coming out. And you may come up with things like when you lay this card out, it may come to mean something completely different to you than you have read in any book anywhere. You know, I'll give you an example. I remember some someone talking about how anytime they saw the chariot card, they automatically thought of their minivan and going on trips, having to go somewhere on a trip. So anytime they see the chariot card to them, that automatically means travel. Whenever they see the chariot card, they know that means they're going to be traveling soon. You're not necessarily going to find that in any like pre, you know, prescribed book of symbolism of what the tarot means. The same thing will happen to you with tarot from doing this exercise. But it also just makes you come up with all of these correspondences and associations that are unique entirely unto you that's going to be associated with magic. So that's another one of the things it does. The opening and closing gestures. Yes, yes. Sarah says you start to formulate your own neural uh, connections. Yes. So um, the opening and closing gesture, and I did this for years, and once again, there's a psychological trick to this. There's a reason for doing this. The opening and closing gesture, all you're doing is holding your hands like this in front of you. And the opening gesture, you're going to open your hands like this, like you're opening a book, and you're looking at the line where your palms meet, where the two palms of your hands are together. You're looking at that line. When you open your hands, you're looking at that line where they meet, not staring at it, not trying to make out lines on your hand, just letting your gaze rest there, just like you're doing with the tarot cards we were describing a while ago. And while your gaze is resting there, you're going to open your hands like this. So the gesture itself, all you're doing is this, this, and this, while letting your gaze rest in the middle of it. So what that does, whenever you do this, first, your gaze is resting on your palms, where the line of your palms meet. So you're looking at something really close to you. Whenever you separate or spread your hands, 
your gaze is going to shift focus because you're not looking, they're not seeing something up close to you anymore. They're looking further down. Whenever your gaze, whenever your eyes shift focus, it automatically, when you practice this consistently over a period of at least a few weeks, whenever you do this and your eyes shift focus, it automatically tells your psyche it's time to do magic. It's time to, you know, how people talk about brain waves, like there's alpha waves and all these different kind of brain waves or whatever. Your brain is going to change frequencies. You're going to feel something happen in your head whenever you do this. The closing gesture. So, so he says, do this before all rituals. Any rituals that you do, you do this before you start. And you're going to feel something happen in your head because your eyes are shifting focus. At the end of the rituals, when it's time to come back to the regular world and deal with, you know, everything around you again and not be focused as much on, you know, these altered states of consciousness, very light. You know, it's not going to be like you're tripping or whatever. We're talking about very light changes in consciousness. Um, you're triggering that anytime you do the opening gesture. When you do the closing gesture, you do the opening gesture in reverse. You start with your hands like this. Well, when your hands are like this, what and your your gaze is going through here, what are you doing? You're looking at your your eyes are falling at something further away, like all the way down to the floor. So when you bring your hands together like this, your eyes shift focus again. Suddenly you're not looking down through there anymore. You're looking at where the palms of your hands meet. It causes your, your, you just shifted your gaze and you're looking at something much closer. Once again, it changes something in your head. You feel some, the change in your eyes causes a change in your psyche. It triggers something. It sends it a message. When your eyes start to change focus like that, it sends it a message like, okay, we're done. We're ready to go back to the normal world. But the closing gesture is just you're looking through here. As you bring your hands together, your eyes focus on where your palms meet, and you snap it shut like you just close the book. That's it. That's the opening. That's the closing. That's it. It's that simple, that easy. There's actually uh, also a bigger, more powerful way of doing this, which they call rending the veil, where you would um, inhale and fill the earth with light, thrust both of your hands forward in front of you like you're piercing the veil of, of reality, piercing the veil of the material world, and then opening, spreading it open and stepping through. You take a step through. Like the, the way I would picture it is, see the room where you're at? When you rend the veil, when you open the veil, see something almost like you're just stepping forward into divine light in every direction. And then you close the veil behind you so that you have left the, you've taken your physical body into the spiritual domain. You've left the physical world behind and entered the, the spiritual world. You are walking kind of with one foot in both worlds at that point because you are a physical being in the spiritual world. You do whatever magic you're going to do in there. You know, whatever it is you're trying to manifest, whatever you're invoking, you do whatever you're going to do with it. And then whenever you're done, you do the same thing. Inhale, fill the earth with light, thrust forward and open the veil step through back into the physical world, into the, into the room where you are, inhale and fill the earth with light, close the veil so that you've left it behind, you're back in the physical world. That makes sense? Uh, Yako says, should you do the gesture facing east? Yes. Yes. Just reading what y'all are talking about. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to read to y'all tonight, um, I talked about this book a long time ago on here when it first came out. That's exactly what it's like, Alicia. Alicia says, 
Open and close to enter, open and close to leave, like opening and shutting a door. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what you're doing. You're opening and closing a door. You open the door, step in, and close it behind you. Just like you'd close the door to a house you were going into behind you. Do whatever magic you're doing when you're done. Open the door, step into the physical world, close the door behind you. Exactly. If you are, Holly's asking, are we supposed to do this with before the LBRP or alongside it? Uh, either one. Either one. Depends on how much you've got time for. That is entirely up to you. However much you put into it is how much you're going to get out of it. Uh, so if you do both together, you're going to get more out of it than if you only do one at a time. Uh, but anyway, um, so... I've talked about this book before and you know, here's the thing. Y'all know that I'm not really into witchcraft at all. Uh, Matt Oren is kind of synonymous with, with writing about witchcraft, but you know, like I said before, I said at one point on here when I was talking about another book, I said, I, I have no desire to be part of that circle jerk magic world where everybody, you know, reviews, everybody else's books and promote. I don't, I don't care about being part of the scene or whatever. It means nothing to me whatsoever. Matter of fact, I don't want to be part of uh, the occult community or, or any of that kind of stuff it means nothing to me. Um, you know, I have my practices. I have the people that I talk to the rest of it. I couldn't care less about. Uh, the reason I'm saying this, my point to this is because if I'm like suggesting a book to you, it means I think there is actually something in it that's going to be a benefit to you, something useful. And I believe that 100 percent with these books. Now, even though like he describes himself as a witch and he writes about witchcraft, which is you know not anything that I'm particularly interested in, he gives exercises and explains things in a way that it, it doesn't matter like what tradition it is, you can still get a lot of use out of this stuff. A lot. I mean, he describes techniques and practices that are, you know, like, like I said, I didn't know there was a path. I thought all I was supposed to be doing was magic, magic, magic all the time and getting better and better at it. He describes, uh, like like some of these practices to do that aren't like you know super complicated pentagram rituals all of that kind of stuff um but what i wanted to read to you what i'm going to read to you from this is just the introduction first there was something else but i'm just going to start with the introduction just because when i read this there was something very reminiscent about my own childhood in this Yep, exactly. Angelica says, witchcraft was my gateway drug into magic. So, so shout out to all the witches putting in work. Mine too. Same for me. Absolutely the same for me. And people will be very judgmental of this and, and talk shit about this uh, because she's not cool or whatever. Like she's considered to be like super cringe because of the way she writes. She's not esoteric. She's not a culty. Uh, but one of the things that allowed me to understand all of the higher aspects of magic, like what you're doing when you're doing a lot of these rituals, because keep in mind, like most of these rituals, like the Golden Dawn stuff, they don't tell you what you're doing. They don't tell you what's supposed to be happening. They don't tell you what to expect. They just give you this paperwork and say, here, go do this. And you figure out the rest of it on your own. One of the things that made me able to understand all of that stuff was the writing of a woman who goes by the name Silver Raven Wolf. Now, that name in and of itself is so cringe. It's crazy, but this woman understands magic inside and out. Don't let, don't let like 
cheesy book covers or, you know, silly names or whatever distract you. It's one of those things, like they say, don't judge a book by its cover. This woman understands the stuff on a level that most people in the high magic world will never understand. So um, I'm going to read you his introduction to this just because it, there was something about it that resonated with me a lot. You know, it was kind of like, like Angelica was just saying, um, like it was her gateway drug into magic. And I'm going to shut up. I'm only going to go for about 10 more minutes and I, then I'll shut up and get off of here. Uh, but let's see. As a child living in a small town in Northern California, I devoured every book on witchcraft that I could get my hands on. I would save a tiny bit of money from birthdays or holidays and go to the bookstore in the mall. And one by one, I slowly acquired a limited selection of books that seemed appealing to me. I was just, it was just enough to immerse myself into learning about the world of magic thoroughly and still few enough to successfully hide from my strict religious grandparents with whom I was living, living with at the time. In middle school, I moved to Southern California to live with other family members, and sadly, I had to leave my witchcraft books behind. However, I heard about a shop down by the beach referred to as a witchcraft shop. In reality, it was a metaphysical store but I soon found that they did indeed have a strong focus on Wicca, witchcraft, and other forms of magic. I eventually started taking bus trips there, and I remember vividly how magical that shop seemed to me as a child. And something about reading that, it was just the same for me. It brought back all those memories of childhood when magic was still new and strange and alien and just part of a different world, something that I knew immediately when I saw, I want this. I want to be part of this. This speaks to me in a way that nothing else does. And, and I'll tell you something else. I'm not just going to go off on a tangent, but just something that I was thinking about um, recently was there were two things two things that I was obsessed with when I was a kid, when I was very young. One was magic, always magic. I was consumed by it. The other, and this is why I don't make fun of anybody for their, their cringe stuff or their cringe likes or whatever it is, karate. You know, everything from like those old karate kid movies to you know, like I said, I was a child of the 70s and 80s. So anything to do with Chuck Norris when I was a kid, like to us, you know, we didn't understand back in like the 70s, 80s. We didn't we didn't know anything about Kung Fu or, you know, Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, any of that stuff that's popular now, like in in the in the 70s and early 80s. It was all about karate. That's that's all anybody in my world knew. To me, in my childhood, the the two things that I used to think, if you've done that, if you do this, you've made it in the world. Like for me, it wasn't about being successful at a certain career or getting a, a certain kind of car or, or getting a degree from some kind of school. I didn't care about any of that kind of stuff. It meant nothing to me. The two things that I would think, if I could just do those two things, I would have made it in the world. I would have what I now know is fulfilled my will. One of those things was write a book about magic. To contribute something to the body of literature that makes up magic. I thought if I could, if I could do that, 
you know, I wasn't thinking about like making money off of it or anything else. I just thought, you know, that's like the epitome of everything in this world. Like if you can do that, if, if you could do that, you've done something. And then whenever I did finally write my first book, High Magic, that's how I felt after I, after I wrote it, I felt like I've completed a big part of my will. I felt like part of my life force had been taken out of me, that I had left, I had put part of myself in that book. I had done one of the things that I always thought would have been making it in this world. One of the other things that I've just recently started doing is I am now officially a white belt in Tang Soo Do karate, which is the Korean Korean version of karate that Chuck Norris practices. It, I can't tell you how much I love it. But one of the reasons that I love it so much is it feels like it turned back time for me. It feels like going back to my childhood. I, I can't even articulate like how light and happy it makes me feel. It's almost as if all of the trauma all of the hardship and the heartache and all of that kind of stuff, everything that happened to me, it's almost like it didn't happen. It's almost like going back to a time when everything in the world was as magical and strange and new as what he's describing in this book about going into those magic shops. There's, there's something that's very important about exactly Andrew. Andrew says, reclaimed enchantment of the world. That's, that's exactly what I was trying to get to. That's exactly what I was trying to articulate. There's something that's very, very important about doing that, about maintaining our sense of the world being enchanted, of the world being a magical place, of it being this amazing playground where we learn and grow and change, but at the same time, we have fun while we're doing it. To keep that, like in Zen, they call it beginner's mind. They say that no matter how long you've been doing these practices, you always want to maintain and keep beginner's mind. Always keep the mind, that sense of excitement and newness and joy that you first came to these practices with. That is very, very important. I didn't realize how important it was for a long time. Yeah, uh, that's another thing. Andrew says in martial arts, we say white belt for life. That is a very, very good way of, of describing it. That is, that is a perfect way of describing it. And one of the things also, you know, that I was just learning recently is how most people think, you know, when you, when you get to the point of, of, finally earning that black belt that you're done. Like you've, you've hit a, a, a peak. 
like you've you know you you've conquered this this subject whatever it is karate jujitsu you know whatever but the way they look at it at least in Tang Soo Do is that's really the starting point. Like once you get to the point of black belt, all that really means is that you've, you've gotten like proficient at all of the, the techniques and, you know, the kicks and the punches and the blocks and all of that kind of stuff. But now, now that you've learned all of those, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to perfect those, trying to get a little better, you know, trying to, to get everything out of it and that, that you can possibly get out of it. And there's so much stuff. There's so much. So there's, and there, there's so much stuff that I'm finding in this that corresponds to magic. You know, for example, one of the things, you know, in order to, to earn certain ranks like master or grandmaster or any of those sort of things, there's certain things you have to do. Like one is uh, be committed to teaching, teaching other people. Another is just doing like community service type stuff. And remember what I was talking about a few weeks ago when I was talking about uh, doing our will. And I swear I'm going to shut up in one second. I didn't read as much of that as I wanted to. I only got a couple of paragraphs in and I want to go back to that because I think it's, it's a very good part. And he talks about the great work and all that sort of stuff. And I want to read that to y'all because I think there's a lot of exercises in here. That's, that's very useful. But, uh, you know, the thing I was talking about when I was talking about like doing your will, how it, it's basically made up of two things. One is finding what it is that you love doing, what you're passionate about. And then two is finding a way to use it to help other people. Because then you're doing your will and God's will at the same time. And it's the same way with some of these practices. It's like you take on this commitment of teaching people these things, and you also are putting in effort to help the community in some way through this platform. So it's doing your will and doing God's will at the same time. So much of the stuff I am finding ties in to the teachings of magic. So much of it. Okay, I am going to shut up. Just seeing what y'all are talking about real quick. Yeah, Sarah says, I'm beginning to see that there's not really a finish line to anything. That is absolutely true. And there shouldn't be. You know, like if you set a finish line for yourself, when you reach that, when you attain that finish line, you start to die. Crowley said something. I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but he said one of the worst things that a person could do was set an attainable goal for themselves. Because once you attain that goal, then what else is there to do? You know, you want to, to be constantly striving and growing like there's, how did you say it? There's not really a finish line to anything. That's the story of life. That's our growth and development. There's no finish line. Even when you complete the great work, that's not a finish line. That's like getting your black belt. From that point on, you're supposed to start perfecting it, going through the process over and over again. Exactly. There's no finish line. Yeah. Another thing, I was walking down the street today, and this is the last thing. I swear I'm going to shut up. 
last thing, I was walking down the street and I saw a sign, just a little sandwich board sign that someone had written on. And it was a Zen saying that's so profound yet so simple at the same time. It said, experience eternity in every moment. And that's also what we're doing, what we're trying to attain when we're doing magic. If you experience eternity, there's no past. There's no future. There is no time at all. There is only the present moment. Yes, Angelica says the power of now. Exactly. Like that thing that I put in one of my books. I can't even remember which one it was or if it was a letter to Eddie Vedder or whatever it was. I just remember him reading it on stage about how, like, if, if clocks and watches were accurate, the only thing they would ever say is now because time is an illusion. You know, we have time in the material world, the physical world, the lower levels of understanding, you know, days and nights and months and years and all that sort of stuff. But step out infinity. When you immerse yourself in doing your will and doing God's will at the same time, and you've got the momentum of the universe at your back pushing your pushing you forward. You're not dwelling in the past. You're not dwelling in the future. You are just immersed in experiencing and enjoying the present moment. And whenever you do that on a deep enough level, you have literally entered eternity. Chris says, come to California sometime. I come to California pretty often, actually. I'm usually there. Up until COVID hit, I was usually there like twice a year. Okay, guys, I'm going to shut up because I have rambled on far too long and about far too many crazy-ass topics tonight. Uh, but thank you all so much for, for being with me, you know, for supporting me, for wanting to listen to all this stuff, for coming on here and talking to me about this stuff. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. You know, like I said, this is one of the things in my life where I thought if I could do this, if I could talk about magic, write about magic, whatever it is, I would have made it in the world. Y'all are, y'all are part of that. Y'all are a huge part of that. You know, otherwise I would be sitting here talking to myself. So I appreciate very much the fact of y'all being here with me. All right. I will talk to y'all in a few days. I love y'all. Have a good night and I'll see you soon.